the idea of picking the right people to empower early on versus trying just to scale yourself more and more and more and more and do kind of all of the things is something that I didn't understand well earlier in my career. Work became, can I squeeze more hours in? Can I add this extra task in? Can I, I, I? Like, that's not what it's about. Uh, it's so about it's a good one. Right? Yeah. Co- coaching the team, empowering the team, making sure that you are really thoughtful about bringing in the right people with the work that you need. Because the person you like the most or the person that seems the most fun or that doesn't matter. It does the person bring the right mindset to the table. Welcome to the Unlearn Podcast, where host Barry O'Reilly seeks to synthesize the superpowers of extraordinary individuals to think big, start small, and learn fast. Here's your host, Barry O'Reilly. Welcome to the Unlearn Podcast. On this show, I'm delighted to be joined by Cecilia Myers, VP of Digital at CDW. Now, Cecilia leads CDW's product management design, demand generation, customer integration, and merchandising teams. Her wide-ranging experience across product management development, marketing, and design have really brought her skills to bear in many different roles that she's taken. She spent time in her early days at a startup, worked and led teams at Groupon, but her mission today is to transform how CDW customers digitally interact with their world-class sellers. She's a survivor of lymphoma, leads many charity initiatives in lymphoma research, and mentor to angels, and lives in Chicago. But it's been a real pleasure getting to know and work with her over the last few months in her teams. So before we understand what she's doing today, let's talk a little bit more about what drew her into product management as someone who actually studied literature for their undergrad. The thing I did try to do was always choose roles where I thought the people were interesting. And I thought the job seemed interesting and it just seemed like there was some kind of maybe undefined, but there was opportunity there to learn. And so when I left school with an English major undergrad, which is one of those, you'll never find a job majors, you know? Yes, a good one to get then. Yeah, right? start with it's, that. Yeah. But you know what? It teaches you how to think and communicate in a way that can be a real superpower in the business world that people don't quite understand always because they don't spend as much time learning that world. But uh, I went to become a personal archivist at a startup that did document management for high net worth people. That's great. Such a strange space. Yeah, of <laughs> course. So this kind of librarian route, like it made sense with my degree. I was like, cool. So I went to Chicago. I joined this startup. And the startup folded with the 2008 crash because it was all high net worth people. And they were like, we're not going to spend our money on this now. You know, everything yeah. just crashed. Yeah. But the VCs, the venture capital firm that funded it, I had built a good relationship with them. They were right next door. This was just in like some loft spaces. And I had known them pretty well. And they said, well, you should stay and join our, our foundry, which is just a bunch of fairly early, early in their experience people who were trying ideas. Yeah, great. That's just been amazing. Yeah. And so just trying stuff. There was a big pipeline of ideas. And I just thought that seems like fun. Like I'll learn stuff, you know, I'll learn about business models and different markets and, you know, lighted on an idea that I just thought seemed really fun, which came to be Cake Style, which is on was online personal styling for women and just built a business. And it was just one day at a time, went from packing all the boxes, doing all of the kind of buying, like really driving around with boxes to ship out in the back of my car. Um, I was like, I was the BS person. You know, I didn't know at the time, it was fun. And I knew this space would be really fun. And I mean, even the, uh, you know, I would say the atmosphere around startups at that point, because this was like... 2011, 2012, something like that. I mean, that was peak kind of startup romantic vibe in the world. And so that was also really interesting and fun. But it was a decision that allowed me to do things so broadly across a business that I really understood, like a very kind of T-shaped model for how to think about it. How do you get in the details and set the boxes? How do you think about where you're going and fundraising and kind of all of that. And I also had the benefit to work with people who had been extremely senior at large companies. So the the co-founders of Sandbox, the venture capital firm, or the former CEO of Monsanto and CEO of NutraSuite. I just, you know, knew them and and still uh, Nick Rosa, who was one of the co-founders of Sandbox, you still have a great relationship with him today. 
he was uh, really instrumental in giving me that experience, believing that I could do things. So that just kind of stumbling into things gave me a ton of great experience. And then ultimately, Cake Style had to shutter. We did not fundraise our second round to kind of take it from we were at a four million dollar run rate so doing pretty well I mean we were profitable yeah no your metrics are amazing I was just I was looking at them here before yeah yeah. it was not you know and and look at stitch fix and the the power of that I mean this is a model that clearly has legs but just couldn't fundraise. I mean, the atmosphere was really difficult. And it was an inventory-based business. I mean that's hard. Venture capital does not like inventory-based businesses and I get it. It's really a cash flow problem ultimately. And so I ended up actually talking to Groupon about acquiring the business. That didn't happen, but that's how I ended up there. So stumbled into another thing. <laughs> yeah, well, like, like, but this is the fascinating thing about hearing people's stories. You know, as you say, like you, you got straight into this opportunity by, you know, as one door closed and the door opened and you're someone who just has the tenacity really to go for it, like to throw yourself all into it and do everything from drive the boxes around town and drop them off. And and many people would say like, that's almost like a skill that enough product leaders don't even do today, that they don't get close to the nuts and bolts of businesses that they're often too far away from the customer's experience. As you were telling that story, I immediately thought of probably, you know, one of the great famous stories of customer development of Tony Shea and, and Zappos, where he would literally buy shoes down the store and post them on the website and let people buy them and, and manually post them to folks to like really yep. experience what that end-to-end experience is like. Most people don't start from there. In many ways, they have to be sort of retrained to go back to those types of experiences. What were some of the lessons you think that helped pick up along the way from just really like living inside these businesses as you were building them? Like, What are some of the things you use today that maybe you don't even think about as much now? It always comes back to, do you understand the problem you're really trying to solve? I almost feel like with, when I say it, it's a cliche in my team. You know, I, It's like first question out of my mouth, what problem are you really trying to solve? But I think people often think they know. And yeah. until you kind of go into the deep into the heart of it, it's very difficult to really understand the collision of things that are making the need rise up to the top. And so it's challenging because as you grow in leadership, you have to be able to navigate the details and the big picture. And that being very facile at doing that is hard. Yes, really And it's hard. something, you know, I, I don't want to pretend like, oh, I've got that solved. This is what you do. Like, it's, it's really kind of a constant balancing act of when do I need to go dive deep and really understand what's going on and listen to customer calls, go sit beside a person doing the job. You know, when do I get there versus when do I find myself so deep that I'm doing everything that that's actually super toxic as a leader because you're not helping your team take that problem on. You're not helping you know others scale you and your vision effectively if you do that. But I do think what I learned is that intimate knowledge of what is really happening is very difficult to replace. There is something to be said for being kind of a super smart non-expert. I mean, this is what consultants do, right? And they aren't necessarily experts in any business, but they have good framework understanding. They come in, they can be really helpful in pointing things out, but they don't really know the business. And so there's some irreplaceable bit of knowledge that they don't have. And you're not really good until you have enough understanding about the business to really intimately understand what your customers need, what your employees are struggling with, and where the things are that are prohibiting you from growth or success. And so it's getting in some amount of details and getting your hands dirty. And it's also fun. There's something really energizing about that, that connecting at a more visceral level to what you're doing that I think if you haven't done it, you you just have to do it. It's it's really fun. And it just gives you a lot back. Yeah, no, I I couldn't agree more. One of my favorite things to do when we run the exec camps is we often take senior leaders from companies out of their businesses to like, have you ever seen the show Undercover Boss? Have you ever seen that show? Oh yeah, totally. I watch a lot of TV. <laughs> yeah, right. Great. Well, what I love about that show is where they, they take these people from like very famous companies and they act as like operators in the business and nobody knows who the CEOs are or the senior executive team most of the time. And yet they get these really amazing experiences about what it's like to be a customer of their business. 
it's one of these sort of really, as you say, it's like a, it's a quite a visceral experience sometimes to be like realizing like why things work or why aren't they operating as, as you would hope. And it's one of my favorite things to do. You know, I often tell the story about we were working with this airline business where they were trying to reinvent how their airports would operate. And we took over an abandoned business lounge for a day and we set up this leadership team in there and they were designing experiments and running out onto the floor of the airport and trying to talk to customers about problems that they were having boarding the plane. And some of them found it so difficult and so uncomfortable and others loved it, right? They, they got so energized by it, but it's just fascinating to see how people deal with that. So as you then shifted into Groupon, right? Cake style didn't work out, but you got an amazing run. Like, like I said, the metrics are amazing. Like over like raising one and a half million and four million run rate. It's just fabulous stuff. Like you say, it's who knows why you couldn't be the next stitch fits. Who it could have been so close, right? But then you shifted into Groupon, which is at that time was a really fascinating business. It sort of was on the bottom of this hockey stick, probably, and just like really starting to accelerate. So tell us a little bit about how some of that skill of getting close to the actual problems helped you, or was there a new set of skills that you sort of had to let go of from the last job and sort of relearn for the next step? Yeah, it was such a culture shock coming even to a place like Groupon, which is 2008 is when it started. So a very modern company, technology is underneath the core of everything it does and how it makes money, but it's still a large company. There's politics. There's the fact that I couldn't, my co-founder and I at Cakestyle could make any decision we wanted together. Yes, we would talk to the board, but right, but we could do whatever we thought was best as long as we had a reasonable argument that held some water. And so that red tape was extremely limited. You go to a place like Groupon and right away you realize that there was a skill I just didn't have at all. And it was being able to sell an argument and construct a really solid business case repeatedly, constantly to lots of different people. Be having to convince finance, which just threw me for the biggest loop. Yeah, yeah, you know, the, the first time best, I ran yeah. into that, like, oh, what? You're telling me I can't <laughs> do this? Like, you know, and they're like, yeah, we are. You're, you know, you're, you're going to have to convince us. You have to have a better argument than that. That was actually a big unlearning for me was that total kind of control of here's the vision and here's how we're going to get there. And we're just going to take this path. And, you know, we can basically call our own shots too. There are all these groups and people who have different responsibilities in the organization that they're going to guard. And you have to build relationships with them. You have to build credibility with them. And you have to figure out how to move relatively quickly because Groupon had a fast paced culture. It's not like it was very slow and plotting. It wasn't. The people move fast there. But how do you move fast to also cover those bases? What was good is having that real understanding of the operations of a business. When I joined Groupon, I joined really their their labs function, which was more in the innovation space of idea, new ideas they were trying to launch. And in particular, it was women's apparel. Oh, nice. Yeah. Yeah. So it was great for me, a great space. And it was kind of within the Groupon goods world. They quickly acquired Ideally, which was one of the fashion flash sites that were big in the kind of mid-aughts. So this is like Guilt Group, Rue La La, Ideally, at one point was the fastest growing company in history. So so was Groupon. And then Groupon acquires Ideally, so you get these two companies grew yeah. way too fast. But at that point, Ideally was fairly distressed and was really struggling with its business model. Groupon acquired it. And I was dropped on as the leadership team from Groupon. So on top of all that, I had to then not only learn all this bigger company stuff, but then also deal with integrating an acquisition, integrating an acquisition that had some, you know, not so great financials, had its own struggles. That was a really good chance to exercise some of the skills I had before, which is really diving in deep to the model and understanding where the challenges were, understanding how to build efficiencies, et cetera, but also still having to really you, when you have a startup, the culture that you've built is the culture you've built. Yeah. When you acquire a company, they have their culture. You have the acquiring company. And so there's a lot of concern, suspicion, like there's a lot to deal with there. And so this was kind yeah. of a, a whole new scope in terms of leading people and managing teams that I really had to consider and learn quickly. 
I think back to if I started Cake Style or if we had gone back and did it again now, the management, people management and leadership qualities I've developed would make me so much better. There's so much that I've acquired, right? And that I'm still acquiring every day. But there's a lot that some of those experiences inside Groupon, especially in Groupon and Ideally, really helped me with. Yeah, it's really tough, right? Some of these lessons you can only learn by doing them as well. I often think, right, like you can't read it in the book when there is an uh, acquisition, whether it's a friendly one or, or one that's actually more like a push for something. It's tough. People always have suspicion, like with their identity, who am I in this new culture? It's really funny as well that you mentioned this idea of like culture piece is so important as well from the start. One of the things in Nobody Studios that I think like the probably the third or fourth person we hired was the chief culture officer. Right? Her name's Sachel, a former employment lawyer who was like literally defending people in these employee liability cases and was just like, I can't do it anymore. I need to get in and start changing the culture of companies. And it's really fascinating um, just listening to her talk so much about integration of like different people from different backgrounds, from different companies, from different disciplines. And it really keeps reminding me like just how difficult that is. And every company is different, just like every job people have is different, right? You're even telling your stories of when you were in the startup mode and they're going into Groupon and, and now you're in a company like CDW, right? Like huge company, like $20 billion, like just massive in terms of scale and size and impact that it's having. And like helping people go through that process because there's always integration of new folks, whether it's new people coming into your team, whether it's people that you're helping transition to new skills. Like it's a really interesting skill to learn. So what would be some of your advice to people? You know, now if you go back to yourself, you know, in those early days and group on like, what would be some of the advice you'd give to people about how to do that well or how you would have done it differently even then? I think that I would consider a lot the idea of empowerment. I would really focus on that a lot. The empowerment model that you learn as you scale up in your leadership, you just realize really quickly that you can't do it all. And so empowering the team to do it is your job. Your job is to hire the right people. It's to set a vision and give them a framework to work within. That's pretty much it. Because like you do nothing, actually. (laughs) Once you're a leader, you do nothing. You don't actually build anything. You're You're not really running it day to day in that way. And so... The idea of picking the right people to empower early on versus trying just to scale yourself more and more and more and more and do kind of all of the things is something that I didn't understand well earlier in my career. Work became, can I squeeze more hours in? Can I add this extra task in? Can I, I, I? Like, that's not what it's about. That's it's about such a good one. Right? Yeah. Co- coaching the team, empowering the team making sure that you are really thoughtful about bringing in the right people with the work that you need because the person you like the most or the person that seems the most fun or that doesn't matter if does the person bring the right mindset to the table but that's really a big part of what i learned and still like i said i'm still learning that the coaching and empowerment of a team is probably something that i will be continuing to learn about doing better right up until i yeah, till we cash out and say thanks very much for having us. Exactly. Yeah, it's it's That's so great. fascinating though. Like, I think it's great for like I was just reminded listening to you as well. Like, so much of our competency in especially in the beginning of our career is about executing things, like getting stuff done. Startups is all about getting stuff done. Like you say, you're delivering boxes one minute, you're figuring out a marketing strategy the next minute, you're building or prioritizing features the next minute, but it's all execute, 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 execute. In many ways, it builds competency. But as you do those subtle transitions and you're starting to either integrate new teams or build teams, I think it's such a, the easy thing is always to fall back to just keep executing rather than actually how do I create an environment or a system where other people can actually execute on what we're trying to get towards. And I'm really curious to ask you about how your communication stuff then has started to come back into, because I, I get the pleasure to see you in action on, on a regular basis uh, working with teams. And it really strikes me how succinct you are in terms of both communicating to people and reaffirming like what the direction is and why it matters. And so are you aware of that or is that something you practice or did it just, is it sort of uh, 
you know, it's inbuilt to you at this stage. I'm curious to hear that. Yeah. So I would say there's a couple of things that really helped me there. One is I read as much as I can. And I love to read. It is one of my absolute top favorite things to do, if not the favorite thing to do. I don't actually read a lot of business books each year. You know, I I do a small number, but I actually protect my reading for me to read what I want to read. I think that really expands your mind. And it also creates that break from the world that you're in into a world that you can't experience otherwise. And that's what's so interesting about reading. You're experiencing something you probably won't see otherwise. But what it also does is it shows you a lot of different ways of communicating. So you see these different ways of structuring an idea, an argument, a sentence, and you pick those things up. It's osmosis. You just begin to kind of collect them and you create this bigger and bigger toolbox that then you can adapt depending on the situation you're in and depending on the person that you're talking to. And so I think some of it is just trying to read and build up that trove of things that I can lean on for communication. The other thing, though, is really like when you study literature in undergrad, it's all about constructing an argument. It doesn't have to be a right or a wrong argument. That's not the point. The point is you're making a point and you're trying yeah. to make a point that's fairly airtight. And there's definitely logic in there. And that's, that's a big, you know, kind of how are you logically structuring it? How are you being succinct with it too, though? And this was a big turning point for me where I had to really reframe how I thought about communication. When you come out of an academic setting, large words are bonus points. Yeah, of course, you, right. Like you know, long is bonus point, right? I mean, this just like academic journal writing that you read. It's just like very just cumbersome, verbose. It's it's actually not, in my opinion, good writing a lot of the time. Good writing is easy. Yeah. It feels good to read. And so I had been really steeped in that. And then you get to the business world, it's just like your email is over three lines. <laughs> like you better have Sick, a good, good reason. Right. And so you we've been TikTok trained. We only exactly, last. exactly. Yeah, right. And so then it became really about learning really quickly to start with the end and make your key point at the beginning of, of the conversation you're gonna have. Have your supporting logic if the person wants to stick around long enough to hear it. But if you're talking to someone senior, they want the end and they want to know you've thought about it, and that they can trust you. The rest of it's just noise. So what you have to do, and this is kind of getting back to that detail versus the big picture. Yeah. theme that we've been touching on throughout is that if you want to communicate well and clearly, you have to do the thinking up front on the detail of the things you want to say and the things you want to communicate. And then you're re-editing constantly. I would say that is one thing that I'm very aware of and everyone should be aware of. Editing is everything. And editing with somebody else helping you is even better. So nobody can write well on their own. Everybody needs a second set of eyes. It doesn't matter how good you are. And so having people, hey, look at this argument, tell me where your head goes, reformat, make it shorter, make it shorter, make it shorter. That has been something that I spend a lot of time doing, but it helps. I think it really helps be able to speak to a very senior executive and give them a really quick, clear picture of what they need to know, but also hopefully be able to communicate with a team that high level strategy in a way that connects them to it which is another big part of what I would say my job as CDW is now. It's making sure that a product manager on my team really gets their place in the ecosystem and what they contribute. And again, I don't think that I get it right all the time or I'm perfect. I consider that to be a constant work in progress. Oh yeah, totally, yeah. Because I owe that to them ultimately. Yeah, but like a couple of the things that really jumped out as you were I love this notion. I think Katrina Woodkey said it to me once too. Because she's always like, write the whole email and then look at the last line that you wrote and put it at the top and rewrite it. Yeah. You reminded me exactly of a thing she said That's to a me good one time around tip. that. Yeah, love that was that. a great tip. I bet you shared it too. The other thing that really stood out, what you were mentioning as well, was that the next few lines should be supporting the argument if people even get that far down reading it. It's just a really interesting way to think about communicating in the written form, because you have to write a lot in these leadership roles, and then also in the spoken form, which is interesting because sometimes it's more bringing people on a a story and then you give them the punchline at the end versus here's the punchline at the start and here's why, you you know, if you care, this is the steps. So it's really fascinating just to hear like these um, examples, right? Because, you know, you're now like a VP of digital for CDW, it's a huge company, you know, you've got lots of people, 
to keep aligned and to keep engaged and for them to be offering up the challenges they're having, giving feedback to them. And it's all about communication in so many ways. So what would be some of the other things that you've learned along the way about like helping people feel connected to the product vision that you're trying to create, helping people understand the journey that they're going on? And what are some of the things you've noticed in yourself about from when you were, as you say, in the good old days or back in cake style when it was you and your co-founder and you're the two of you in the room to say, right, we're going this way and, and shoot. Now you've got legions of people sort of out there like it, it reliant on direction and feedback from you to help them make those decisions. It's really challenging and it's something that I spend a lot of time thinking about, talking with my leadership team about is how do I effectively scale myself to the team so that they feel connected? That's what I kind of boil it down to. And you don't have the thing you could do before, which is know every single person and build a deep relationship with every single person. You can know them, you can talk to them, you can visit with them, but you don't get that kind of one-on-one. Yeah, totally. You can't do a one-on-one every two weeks with a hundred people. You, you yeah. can't do it. You would, you would be in nothing but one-on-ones. And so what I try to do is one is I try to be as much myself as possible so that they feel like I am a person that they can chat on teams with a question. Yeah. Like I am not one of those execs that sits with my team shut off. Like you can chat me anytime, you know, I'll hop on a call. Like if you want to ask me something and I've had people take advantage of that and it always makes me really happy because like, yeah, of course. It's one like of the I really best. can yeah. do that ad hoc and I'm happy to, but I also try to be really open with them about who I am as a person. And that's, something I learned from John Seebeck, who brought me into CDW. He's always been very open as a leader. And I'd never seen anybody be like that before him. And it's incredibly effective. And it also makes him a really lovely person. But being able to just be myself to talk about things that are challenging, and to let people know that like, I'm a person, things are hard for me too. We're, We're really not actually that different. I simply hold a different role in the organization that requires me to really be the central force of the vision. But my respect and interest in the day-to-day is actually really deep as well. And also, you know, I have the same challenges of, you know, I've got a three-year-old and he gets sick. And, you know, I have to, you know, have him running around in the background while, you know, I'm, you know, trying to present to the EC. Like things happen too. And it means that those things are okay. It's okay to bring yourself And I think that does help. Trying to do that as much as possible helps. And also that uses a position of leadership to hopefully make others feel more comfortable about bringing themselves to work to the degree that they want to. Because it's easier for someone like me in in a VP role because I've kind of got support of CDW to be able to say, I'm going to cut out and go get my kid. If I can do it though, I hopefully that means that they feel like they can do it too, which is what I want. It's fabulous, right? And I think, again, it's one of these great lessons that maybe the perspective is that we, sometimes you have to create a persona almost of what leader you, you think you should be. And that takes energy and it takes you away from being your best. Similarly for me, one of the biggest ahas I, I've had was like, it's actually the best person to be is myself. I still remember I was actually doing a talk one time and one of my buddies at ThoughtWorks at the time, his name's Sam Newman. He's very funny and he's very candid. I was giving a talk and at the end of the talk, I came off and he was like, who was that up there? I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, who was that? Uh, I was like, it was me. He goes, that's not you. I don't like that person up here. They're not you. (laughs) Who are you trying to be? And it just made me laugh. And I was like, oh my God, yeah, maybe I am trying to be, you know, somebody I think people want me to be when I'm like giving a talk or talking to people or whatever it might be. And it was one of those big aha moments for me where it's just like, actually, yeah, I, I should just be myself. And you know, it just, it takes no energy to beat me. And like you say, like, it's really helpful, I think, because it makes people feel approachable. Your, your team will offer up challenges to you and normalize a lot of these behaviors. Like you say, we often joke about chasing our, I have a two and a four-year-old running around, yep. smashing through calls all the time. <laughs> I love it, right? And, but you're human, as you say. And I think that's a really empowering way, actually, and an empathetic way for people to lead. I love seeing more of that in folks and encouraging as well, because the feedback most people share is that they, they're willing to offer up like difficult information to share, like something didn't work out that they tried, or yeah, yeah they are struggling with situation at home or wh- whatever it might be. 
that's impacting what they're trying to do their best and you get great information because people can see you're human. And I think that's a, a really powerful tip for people to remember is that you don't have to create a persona. You can, you can actually just be yourself. That's right. And I think that it's also that it's not going to hold you back to do that. Right. It's going to help you go faster. Yeah, that's it. Right. Or it can just help you get the support you need. And, you know, when I joined CDW, I was three or four months in and I was diagnosed with lymphoma, which is like, you know, had a new baby at home, diagnosed with lymphoma, brand new job. And, you know, the instinct is to you worry if I share this, it's going to hold me back. People are going to think, oh, she's sick. We don't want to give her things. She's not going to be able to work. She's not going to be able to achieve, you know, what we need her to. So there's this instinct to keep it to yourself, but you can. I mean, you can't keep that to yourself. It's too physically obvious that you're sick. So, you know, it kind of forced me to be open because I had Mm. to be. But also the ways that I have found that that has helped people kind of feel like they can also talk about things and bring illness, family illness, things that they need to do outside of work in, they felt comfortable was a thing that really helped me understand how that can be really good for teams and how that, again, being yourself, bringing that in, being open about it can really help the team as a whole connect and feel like you're a real person. And so even if you don't have that time to scale to every single person to do one-on-ones every other week or every month, the fact that you're being a person in the larger ether of the culture you're creating can really help them. Yeah, no, it's fabulous. No, I love it. So looking forward then, what are you most excited about? You know, like you're in the middle of building or transforming a business to be a technology-led business, fascinating project to be part of. What are you looking forward to and excited about? Well, I'm really looking forward to watching CDW evolve, how it goes to market as a, I'm going to say technology first. And that's funny because, I mean, we sell technology. That's what CDW sells, right? So in that way, of course, we're technology first, but I think in the way we go to market and the way we enable the relationship between us and our customers and our partners, that being technology at the heartbeat of it, to be at the center of that with some of my other partner groups, especially technology, it's really fun. I I honestly, like, I want to see the day when we're watching a TV ad for CDW and the stuff we've built is what they're showing on the screen. I mean, that is kind of the ultimate for me for the team, right? I just, I want them to see, oh my gosh, this new, you know, digital homepage we built, this new kind of experience that we built for our customers. You know, that thing that I, you know, was in the trenches on the design screens and the data fields and all of that just grueling stuff that people have to do to bring these experiences to life in a way that feels easy. Just seeing that be real and be played back is I think going to be a really big moment for us. So that's something I'm looking forward to. I'm looking forward to also, you know, one of the things when I joined CDW is, I mean, it was pre kind of any of this transformation happening. It was kind of a, I saw Chris Lakey taking over as CEO and I thought she got it that we needed to do this. And it was kind of a bet that that was going to hold true and it has. But just being able to see this, to see CDW be a place to do product management and product design and technology well in the market, to yeah. change it eventually into a destination for talent. That is one of the things that I really wanted to do in addition to kind of the larger business model transformation. Because it's, it's a really like lovely place to work. The people are wonderful. It's a really supportive company. I mean, it's got just these really wonderful qualities. And I think it's kind of one of those gems people don't really know about as being a great place to work, particularly in the product space and the technology space. And so I also think, you know, just building that as a culture and a, as a destination for talent is something I want. And it's also good for the team. I mean, that's something I do think about is I want CDW to be not just recognizable because it's, you know, a Fortune 200 company, but recognizable because it builds great product and experiences and that people know these folks went through a serious transformation. You know, they've taken it from point A to point Z and and that says something about their abilities. Because I I think that's important. You have to be thinking about what are you giving people for their experience all the time because they should be building a stronger and stronger profile with you if you're doing it right. Yeah, well, it's a pleasure watching you and the team do some amazing things and continue to grow and keep building and 
making it a product destination for the future. There's no doubt about it. Thank you so much for being on the show. It's been great to spend time and hear your story. And thanks for sharing it with us. Thanks so much, Barry. This has been fun. Hey, everyone. I hope you enjoyed that show, but I'm even more delighted to share the exciting news. I've recently co-founded a new venture studio named Nobody Studios. Now, Venture Studio is a vehicle for the rapid creation of new companies from ideation to acceleration and growth. And our purpose at Nobody Studios will be to de-risk pre-seed stage business ideas. We'll do this by minimizing the time, speed and capital involved in validating truly repeatable and scalable business models before any significant venture investment. We have an audacious goal to start 100 compelling companies over the next five years, and who knows how many beyond that. So if you're interested in radically changing the way work is done, how products are created, companies built and funded, even democratizing the wealth creation and how returns are distributed, this could be the business for you. We're looking for talent, capital, and influence. If you wish to contribute any or all of these, just get in touch. You can follow us on nobodystudios.com, on our LinkedIn page, all the social media accounts, or simply my newsletters and what I'm sharing. We'll be launching a truly innovative crowdfunding campaign, and I'd be honored if you'd be willing to join us on this journey and become a nobody yourself.